I'm Mayor David Narkowitz, and welcome to the Mayor's Report. Come on into my office. Welcome to the very first episode of the Mayor's Report. My goal for this program is to provide the residents of Northampton with updates and information about the programs and, and initiatives that we're working on here in the city, as well as take you out and around the city to see some of them up close and meet the people who are working on them. I hope this will provide a valuable resource for residents to be able to understand the work that I'm doing as your mayor every day, as well as the work being done across our city, not only by the employees of the city, but the many volunteers in our city who help make city government work. Before we get into this month's episode, I wanted to just give you a few updates on things that I've been working on uh, during the first six months of my administration. Probably the biggest, uh, single biggest project has been the FY 2013 budget. Uh, which has gone into effect on July 1st. Uh, this is a 96 plus million dollar budget uh, and uh, it reflects my administration's commitment to funding the programs and initiatives that provide vital services to our city. Uh, it also reflects my initial efforts to try to streamline city government and make sure that we're providing those services in the most cost effective fashion. I want to thank all of the people on my staff uh, as well as my city department heads for helping me put this budget together. I want to thank the city council for their uh, thoughtful deliberation of the budget. And most importantly, I want to thank the people of Northampton who came out to the six town hall budget meetings that I held around the city to provide their input into this budget. All of that input is reflected in this document and I hope you'll go to our website and take the opportunity to read our budget and see the very uh, the, the line item detail that we've tried to provide to you so that you can understand how your tax dollars are being spent. And we're going to be monitoring the budget. We're now only a month or so into the new fiscal year. We're going to be monitor monitoring spending and revenues very carefully and making sure that we meet the goals of that budget uh, and be able to provide the services that we outlined in it. Some other initiatives that I've been working on, I, I have formed uh, my Economic Development Advisory Commission. This is something uh, many of you uh, heard me speak about during the campaign. Um, I've put together a group of, uh, of citizens, of business owners, of people that are involved in our local economy to advise me on issues related to economic development, whether it's supporting uh, our, our local businesses that we already have in place or whether it's figuring out strategies for attracting new businesses to our community. One of the first projects that we've worked on together uh, has been uh, posting a new job description for a city's economic development director. That posting is out and we're going to begin interviews soon to hopefully bring on a person to work with me to forward the, the city's economic development strategy. We've also put together a passenger rail advisory committee to work on the return of passenger rail, inner city passenger rail to Northampton. That'll be happening uh, next year. Uh, we had a presentation uh, by the uh, Department of Transportation um, who, who gave us an update on the work that they're going to be doing over the next several months to upgrade the tracks uh, to make sure that uh, all of our uh, track system is safe, intersections, uh, uh, bike uh, crossings, etc. And this new advisory commission is going to be working with me to make sure that that transition to the return of passenger rail to Northampton is a smooth one and that there's lots of community input. We've also been working on a number of technology issues, uh, trying to make sure that our technology is up to date. Um, I'm really excited about the new cloud computing initiative that we've put in place. We recently moved all of our email and other desktop apps away from a server-based system onto the cloud. Uh, city government is now using uh, Google Apps for government, uh, which I hope will not only be more cost efficient, but allow uh, city workers to be able to use their email and other communication systems uh, seamlessly and without interruption. We're doing a similar thing with Munis, which is our city's uh, financial and personnel computer system. We're in the process of migrating that from a server-based system to a cloud-based system, which again uh, will save us money uh, and, and not have to spend dollars on reinvesting in hardware. And finally, uh, a really exciting initiative that I also talked about during the campaign was CityStat. CityStat is an initiative that was uh, launched first in Baltimore, but it's now taken on around the country, and it's a performance management system for government, 
where we really try to look at data around the performance of city government and how we deliver the services on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's helpful for us as your government to, to make sure that we're doing the best job we can. It also is a way to provide information to the public. And I'm pleased that we were selected as one of 20 communities across the Commonwealth uh, earlier this month to participate in a new uh, pilot program, and this is through the Community Innovation Challenge Grant, uh, which is going to allow us to have an analyst provided by the state to help us put in place a performance management system so that we can begin to crunch some of the numbers and some of the data that we have to figure out whether we are providing the services and using the resources as effectively as we can. So those are some of the things we're working on, and I look forward to providing you with updates uh, in future episodes on other initiatives. To start off this first episode of the Mayor's Report, I'm really excited uh, to be able to take you over to Center Street, and we're going to take a look at the brand new Northampton Police Station, which has been under construction. And we're going to meet with Chief Sinkowitz, and he's going to give us a personal inside tour of the new station. So let's go over there now. Hi and welcome. I'm uh, Mayor David Narkowitz and uh, we're actually coming to you right now from the city's brand new uh, police station, the new Northampton Police Station, which has been open and operational for uh, about a week and a half now. I'm here with uh, Police Chief Russell Sinkowitz, who's going to give us, a, uh, give us a tour of the new facility. And welcome all. Uh, I know the Mayor has been involved in this as the City Council President, as a member of the Building Committee, has been a strong supporter for it. Uh, it's been a building long in uh, my mind uh, since 1994 when I took over as chief and after 18 years of hard work getting it to this point with uh, Mayor Narkwitz's help, Mayor Higgins' help and many other people, uh, we're here. We've been in the building for about a week and a half, fully operational now, kind of doing our shakedown crews and testing a lot of the uh, high uh, technologically rich uh, environment that we work in. So, welcome everyone. And we're in the lobby, so this will be the first place that most people will see from the public who come into the station. Um, this lobby area, and then the uh, officer on duty. Officer on duty. Whenever you're ready. To our rear here, to our uh, right. Just outside the uh, lobby area, the community room, is what we call our station officer position. That's a position manned uh, generally 24-7. Uh, their duties include uh, monitoring all the 55 different cameras we have in the building for the cell block and our security features, so, and also running the radio. Uh, I'll take you right in there right now. So as you can see, again, I said a very technologically rich building. We have multiple points of surveillance for our cell block, our booking area, the computer systems that link us to the state and national databases. Uh, that's what the desk officer's responsibility is. Understand we have a separate civilianized dispatch center, 13 employees up uh, at the fire station uh, facility. But we do maintain an officer position here whose responsibility is to monitor prisoners, uh, do walk-ins after hour, and assist the citizens. So, uh, again, you can see the various different equipment that's uh, tucked into this room. Right. These are the folks that would, if someone came in after hours, they would be coming to this window to... They would be coming to this window. Or, you know, the officer normally is here, but uh, they do have other duties in the building mm -hmm. uh, to check on prisoners, to assist in booking. Provide paperwork to the officers doing the reports. Mm -hmm. So generally, uh, as soon as you pick up the phone, the phone rings, and somebody will shortly come serve you. Excellent. Excellent. Right. Okay. Okay. So this is the uh, community room and also our training area. We haven't had a policy design yet for outside our agency's use. Uh, currently, we're scheduling multiple different trainings uh, for uh, regional purposes, uh, homicide classes, forensic classes, uh, various different instructors that we can bring in now. In our old building, our largest room, which was our lunchroom, sat six people. Now we can accommodate 50 people in a class. Uh, we have state-of-the-art projectors, being able to hook up computers, uh, screens, uh, very interactive. Uh, room here and uh, the advantage for their police department is now that we can schedule these trainings uh, that bring people in from all over New England uh, we get the benefit of uh, free seats in the class and uh, reducing our cost for travel and lodging uh, to go to whether it's Virginia or other places so we have some uh, nationally recognized instructors coming to the area and that also helps decrease the cost for our 
police departments around us to be able to attend locally here. Uh, so this is our new training room. Excellent. As we work our way around the first floor building, there's an area, our records division, we have three civilian clerks that work here. You can see it's a fairly nice spacious room and also understand when you see the size of some of these rooms understand that this building is being built for a 50-year uh, lifespan uh, and for growth for the police department uh, but our records clerks handle all the paperwork the accounts payable uh, you name it accident reporting there are quality control uh, for police officer reports and uh, we're very uh, report driven paper driven uh, department so most of the records are secured here and the older records we have an archive room upstairs. Our first floor copy fax printer room. Uh, during the day it's open to records. Uh, at night and uh, overnights uh, the records area is secure. You can see the electronic key fob which monitors and is our security control for almost the entire building. Uh, but when records is closed, the patrol force has the ability to come in here to print their reports, copy whatever it is that they need. <clears throat> in our old building, we had one office smaller than this that three sergeants shared. Uh, now we have two offices. One each uh, office has three sergeants, the day shift sergeant, the evening shift sergeant, and the night shift sergeant, so that you have privacy in each of these two offices. Again, the second sergeant's office, the day shift, evening, and the night shift. And Chief, just to explain to people sorry, what the role of a sergeant on a shift. In well, terms. Ser well, sergeant's essentially the street supervisor. Um, they are the person responsible for the officers on the street. The officer in charge will be the, generally the lieutenant. Uh, I'll show you their officer shortly. But they're in charge of each of the three shifts, the evening shift, the, the night shift, and the day shift. And quite often on the lieutenant's days off, I'll have two sergeants, one of which will be acting as the officer in charge. They'll be in charge of the station, watching the prisoners, anything that goes on in the building, and the other sergeant will be on the street. But given our staffing shortages over the years, there's quite often only one lieutenant or one sergeant working. And they have the dual responsibilities of both whatever goes on in the street and what goes on in the station, uh, which is kind of difficult for them. Uh, particularly, we have some very young officers that need more supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a very young department, so uh, it's been somewhat of a, I won't say strain on them, but we do schedule overtime more than we used to just to make sure we have enough supervision to make sure our younger officers uh, have what they need on the street mm -hmm. for guidance. As we come around the corner here, uh, a ready room, which is roll call. Okay. So this is uh, for people who watch police shows and watch the you know morning roll call this is the yep. kind this is this is that room where you all the shifts come in and and uh, and correct. meet and meet for briefing on, on some of the things they'll be working this is on where shift day. change happens that's mm -hmm. correct uh, our old room the 18 or 20 people at uh, shift change had literally stood shoulder to shoulder they had no place to sit no place to put their gear we can now sit those 18 to 20 people down in this room Again, we're still in a transition mode. We have some furniture. We're still waiting for delivery, some things that need to be hung on the walls. But we can uh, pull quite a few people here. We can do a smaller class trainings. So again, a room that's set up for it. We're connected with the internet with the system. We do a, a substantial amount of online training with the Massachusetts Police Training Council and other sources. So uh, we're constantly in a training mode, keeping our officers' uh, skills up and uh, keeping all their certificates uh, valid. So this gives us a, a great place to do some training. And also this is the officer's report room. The old report room essentially was able to sit three people. Uh, as you can see, this room is substantially larger. So now we can have uh, multiple officers doing their reports at the same time instead of waiting for a turn at the terminal. So just explain to people who may not be familiar with the work flow and the reporting strip so when an officer is out on the street and they um, they have to then report on the activities the things that they do during their shift correct virtually every call that goes that we receive there's an instant card that's punched that documents it and every call that an officer goes on or every self-initiated call or a traffic stop or whatever is documented by the officer much of the minor work can be done in the cruisers with the mobile uh, laptop computers they can do the two or three line narratives for small incidents mm -hmm. 
um, and we answer over 120 calls a day. So you can do the math. Each officer has easily 10 to 20 that they're responsible for. Um, but anything that involves a more substantial report, a larceny, a, you know, a medical incident, whatever, they come in here and sit down at the terminal and uh, fill out the information on the report, mm -hmm. do whatever they say they need to do for court complaint. Mm -hmm. um, document a motor vehicle accident, do all the drawings and the narratives uh, on the computer so it's electronically reported and those reports can be forwarded to the state. Uh, and you have an online reporting uh, capability for citizens who want to report minor uh, minor incidents? Correct, through our website. Uh, there's a cop logic link, it's online reporting. Uh, if it's not a crime in progress, if you're not in danger, it's a, a bicycle that went missing two or three days ago, you know, the easiest way is to go online. Uh, click on that icon, it's a prop that follows you through all the questions, and each of those get reviewed. If there's something that your bike larceny might be related to an investigation of other bike larcenies, once it's reviewed, the officer will call you and follow up and get more information. But a lot of the very minor cases can be just entered that way. Okay. And then uh, uh, you're, uh, have the opportunity to print your report mm -hmm. as a preliminary report for insurance purposes, which is... Uh, what some people prefer to do. Exactly. Yeah. But it's you know whenever they don't ever think just go to Cop Logic and online if there's a suspect if you think you're in danger or if anything like that uh, it's really for the very minor past yeah. uh, property crimes. Mm -hmm. And then I don't need to show it to you but down this hall is the individual offices for each of the lieutenants. Um, the lieutenants, all three of them, those uniform lieutenants, used to share one office. Uh, smaller than this room, and uh, now they each individually have their own office. And as we kind of um, see our design here for mailboxes, gear bags for the officers when they come on duty, they can just store their stuff out of the way instead of stacking it in the hallway like they used to have to. And um, it's just a nice thing. Arch. Our detention area, which I cannot show you because unfortunately as you arrived, so didn't uh, an arrest. And I can't bring you in there, but it is a substantial improvement for booking over our old uh, area that was 40 years old. Uh, very substantial cell block, highly monitored video audio, all the new technology for booking, uh, handicapped cell block, video monitoring room and interrogation and interview room. And on the other side is what we call the Sally Port. Once the parking structure is built and the deck is on, we'll have access to that. And the Sally Port is essentially a drive-in garage that once you're in the garage, the door comes down, the officer stores his weapon in a gun locker, much like these gun lockers here. Again, no guns are locked in the booking area. They essentially store their weapon, lock it, take the key, get their prisoner out, bring him into booking. And the Sally Port is large enough to comp uh, accommodate the big fire department ambulances, very large vehicles um, that need to run and idle uh, while they're in treating a prisoner slash patient. And so the Sally Port is designed to have detectors for the sulfur dioxide buildup. And once it reaches a certain level, there's a ventilation system that su uh, sucks the bad air out. So, And it can also accommodate a half-size school bus when we have multiple uh, mass arrests. So, okay. And that takes us through the first floor. Good. You're, you're now on the lower level, again on the Gothic Street level, uh, the Gothic Street parking area uh, will abut our garage that you'll see shortly. But primarily the, the majority of this area is either locker rooms for the, the police officers, or the male and females, uh, but property and evidence. Uh, the fact that we have so much property and evidence that needs to be stored, we have a nice systematic system of processing. Uh, when a piece of property evidence comes into our possession, it gets tagged upstairs by the officer, they print a barcoded tag, they stick it to the tag, stick the tag to the property and evidence and hand it to the supervisor. The supervisor comes down and enters it into the logbook, notices which locker is available, locker 13, puts the evidence in, closes it, locks it, now no one from this side can get it. When the property and evidence officers process it, and there's only four of them that have authority to get into these rooms, and I'm not one of those people that can get into those rooms, they open the door on the other side, they then log it in electronically on a computer, and they store it, and I'll show you that in a minute, their high density uh, storage area. But every one of these things, including the refrigerator for bodily fluids, uh, different things that we need to keep refrigerated, 
they get put in there, there's a door on the other side. So once it's done with the sergeant, no one can mess with it. It preserves our chain of custody. And also we have storage for bulky items. Large area, cage for just some bulky items and sometimes uh, odorous prisoner clothes that we get stuck with after they go to court. I mean, essentially this room is a large area with high density storage. They're rolling units, so you can gain uh, almost 50% more storage capacity in a similar sized room with these larger rolling units. And this is all the long-term storage, firearms, again, secure stuff, narcotics. And again, it's an area I can't even get into. Only four people in the department have access to it. So if anything ever goes missing, uh, I'm the one that's responsible for investigating it. So my not having access presents that you know prevents any issues about whether I was the one that went in there. And again, everything in this room is 24/7 video monitored on uh, two different systems. Um, and again, everything is an electronic key fob, so you not only know who's going in. So as a key fob gets activated, the user of the key fob also gets their picture taken. So there's double security if someone's not using somebody else's fob. Uh, but anything they do inside this, this area, whether it's the crime scene technicians, the property and evidence room, is all the videos that over their head whenever they're in there. So, and when the room's empty, frankly. Chief, does this kind of evidence, uh, so when a crime is going to be prosecuted by like the district attorney and, a, and the prosecution takes over, where did, does the evidence stay here in your custody for it's, them to, throughout the trial process? Throughout the trial process until it's called for by the court. Okay. And then it returns here unless, until the court releases it. And quite often, defense attorneys will file immediate uh, appeal mm -hmm. uh, intentions, which means we've got to hold the evidence mm -hmm. for whether it's a year, two years, five years, how many years it takes. And there's currently uh, some legislation pending at the state level that any and all bodily fluids or any DNA collection uh, that is collected as part of a criminal investigation, uh, whether it's used in a trial or not, uh, police departments are going to have to keep that in their custody until either the sentence is completed, all probationary or parole conditions are completed, or all rights of appeal have been exhausted, which could be 15 years. So, so part of the consideration in designing a space like this is having well, the problem capacity is to, absolutely. to have evidence that you may have to hold on to for multiple, multiple years. And unfortunately, when we designed it, this law didn't take, hadn't ah. taken effect yet, so we don't have a big enough refrigerator. <laughs> okay. So it's something else we're going to have to get. One of the things we wanted to make sure That's we did was in, uh, include an uh, exercise room for our officers, but part of the budgetary problem was the, uh, we couldn't afford to pay for the equipment. So the officers on their own went out and did some fundraisers, did some uh, receptions that the community members contributed money to. Uh, there was also Smith College, Northampton Athletic Club, Universal Fitness contributed some equipment. And with the money that they were raised, we were fortunate that there was a almost brand new health club in Greenfield that was going bankrupt. And they uh, pretty much took the $8,000 that they raised and bought thirty dollars to $40,000 worth of equipment that they physically disassembled and reassembled in this room. So you can see it's well outfitted, but it was all at the officer's own uh, ability to raise money. And we still have it. Again, we've only been in this building for about two weeks. So we're still sorting out locations, but you can see it's getting used already. It's good. And again, people should understand our officers do not work out on duty. They work out on their own time. Uh, it's part of the deal of uh, providing this area. And you have fitness requirements for your officers? Well, they're not requirements as much as common sense for the officer. You know, there's nothing written in stone, but if we have an officer that apparently is getting out of shape, then we have spoken to and put into a contact with a doctor or a dietitian or whatever. And right now, essentially, there's a non existent plan to supplement the officers to be able to join health clubs at the city's expense. Having this here has been the kind of home run. It's, it's, getting, more, it's getting a lot of use more and more people used to it. So that's great. And then again, we'll just quickly run connected to the uh, evidence and property areas our crime scene services. Again, two rooms, a lab for pro uh, processing, fumigating, doing all the print 
fumigating, and then another office area for their uh, records. Service. And this is again one of the rooms you don't have access to, so no. it's there, so we okay, can yeah. have pictures so that uh, you can yep. see. That's why I have the pictures put up. Yeah. Main storage, uh, locker rooms. We gotta go back to the way anyway, I'll show you. So down this hall is a, our armory. Can you hear me? So this area is, includes our armory, which is where we store, store all our ammunition and weapons uh, that are not on assignment. The AR-15s and whatnot that are not in the cruisers. Uh, so our extra weapons, extra ammunition. When the officers need to clean their guns after practicing, they have a gun cleaning seat that collects all the chemicals. And then this <coughs> is well, hopefully someday when we can afford it, we'll be allowed to fit this firing range. Um, so just to explain when we were going through the building mm -hmm. process and we needed to uh, stay within the, the budgetary limits, we had to do some value engineering of the project and, and take out some of the things that, that had Correct. been the original design and, and this range was one of those items. We have built the internal systems to support it Absolutely. and obviously we've done the hardened walls and all the system the the structure for it. The, the physical shell they call a coffin is all steel uh, encased with concrete and it's also uh, acoustically separated from the rest of the building. So any, any noise or vibrations in this room won't happen. The original budget for the building creeped up to $19.6 million um, over the two-year period of time that we went through the recession, the economic crisis, and then we started to go back out to bid. Prices changed a little bit. And one of the more expensive things is about the $250,000 that it would cost to outfit this with the bullet recovery, the uh, lead recovery system, and all the targets, uh, uh, electronics, and pulleys and wires and whatnot. Um, so it is ready if we can ever find the money and there is some hope at the end of the project. See, we've been doing so good on budget. Um, literally have only touched tens of thousands of dollars of the 300,000 or more contingency fund. Uh, we may be in a position to be able to afford to outfit this, but right now we built it and hopefully someday we'll be able to fund the uh, And like the equipment. training, like the training room, there's a cost savings because you're right now you're, you're having to pay to have your officers stay certified with their weapons, mm -hmm. bringing in an outside service to do the range where we can go to other ranges as opposed to just doing it here in-house? Well, yes and no. I mean, we, we have the outside range that we do at the uh, Florence Revolver Club, Northampton Revolver Club, mm -hmm. and that's really active. That's getting out of the cruiser, take, seeking cover, being able to you know, quickly get the AR-15 out of the trunk or whatever it is that you need to do work in concert with another officer on a shooting scene, contact cover, that's stuff you can't really replicate in here. But the more other elaborate refining your skills, uh, we've been using a company called Blue Line and they come up with a trailer and they set it up at DPW and we work in there in live uh, uh, kind of fire scenarios. It's not dummy at bullets, it's real ammunition. And they go through all these video scenarios of shoot, don't shoot, etc. That's what we would hope to be outfitting this with. And instead of spending in excess of six thousand dollars a year using blue line uh, for all their technology we over the period of time would be able to recoup that money and also have our officers have it available all the time instead of just once a year would the facility also be something that officers in other uh, jurisdictions would would could use or potentially use or it could be an option yeah could be an opportunity to uh, uh, create some funding mm -hmm. yeah. by doing that I mean there's there was a lot of things kicking around in my head about yeah. how to fund it uh, none of which I can act on until exactly. I can we'll actually get the project, get finished. the firing yeah. range outfitted. So exactly. Now, when I took over as police chief in '94, our locker area was only used high school lockers. They were tiny, and the area was co-ed. Female officers and male officers had to use the locker room. And even since 1978, when I was a police officer, we never had a functional shower in our police facility. So this facility in '94, when I took over as chief, we carved out an area of our cellar to make a female locker room. Just a small, crummy little area, but at least they had privacy. So the beauty is we have a large, beautiful tile locker room, um, which unfortunately there's people that are getting changed now, both for the men, for the women. Two showers, just well-designed, uh, very attractive. Large lockers, um, 
good air circulation, so they're damp clothes and their ballistic vests don't collect mildew. They each have four gang outlets, so they can plug in their radios, chargers, or flashlight chargers, other electronics. And then they also have a large st storage drawer where they are, have a place to keep files now that they used to not be able to keep, and all their tactical equipment and uh, bio and hazmat uh, suits that they have in different bags, which we used to just have to stack up in wherever we could find space in the old building. So it's much more efficient. And again, this building is designed for 50 year life. Um, this room is, uh, both these locker rooms are designed to hold uh, 100 lockers. It should staff ever increase. Uh, but we didn't buy all 100 lockers because the aforementioned really large powered up uh, lockers are uh, about $1,000 a piece. So mm -hmm. we bought enough lockers for a little growth, but not uh, up, upwards of 100. But should we ever grow to that number, uh, we'll be able to accommodate the officers in these rooms. And part of the design process was there was a needs assessment done mm -hmm. by an outside consultant that looked at what would be the 50-year needs of the city. So that Well, our current need is several more police officers than we have, yeah. but the budget just doesn't allow it. Yeah. So the anticipation is future growth could be as much as 100 personnel mm -hmm. over the next 50 years. So We're currently guys. Okay. We just stepped off the elevator to the second floor, uh, which is one story above Center Street. Again, two stories above Gothic Street. This is essentially the administrative and uh, detective bureau wing, uh, as well as the lunchroom, which you'll all get to see. As I had mentioned before, the previous building was woeful for conference rooms and meeting areas. Uh, we have, to my left here, a small conference room that I'll turn the lights on. You can stay there and take the picture. Which is outside the administrative area. So if I have a, a family or somebody that I need to speak with, or the detectives have multiple people that they need to interview, they can place them in here. In fact, the two women that, and the sergeant you saw coming off the elevator was here having a meeting about our mental health first aid program and how that's working. Out. So they have the option of these smaller meeting rooms, um, which is just great. And then stepping up, this room has got more use than I even thought. This is a larger conference room. Um, and when I have, used to have staff meetings with 14 or 16 of my personnel, uh, which is a normal number, uh, we would have to rent spaces offsite or find some place in the city. Uh, this room was designed to accommodate that number of people. And uh, surprisingly, we've used it for all kinds of group meetings where the investigators are working with the district attorneys on a group. Uh, particular crime or uh, different lawyers needing to meet with us about different issues. This has actually been getting more room than we even anticipated, which is great, and we're glad that we have it. Okay, this is the administrative waiting area. Uh, to my right, your left, is my administrative assistant. She's responsible for personnel files, records, payroll, and some of the accreditation work and the scheduling of uh, travel for people during training as well as being the administrative assistant to myself and the captains. And so, it's a nice, bright area. I really like it. It's five times the size of my old office. And it's just a, a blessing to have such a nice place to work. Coast out. Captain Joe Administration, Joe Marcus. Space. Hi, Captain. Yeah, good to see you again. he was stuffed into a very small area, much like the rest of us in the old building. He now has the room large enough to accommodate Calvin Coolidge's law partner's desk, so. Mm -hmm. Captain of Operations has a similar office. Training mm -hmm. an incident room. Uh, should something happen to dispatch operations or civilian dispatch operation at the fire station? A catastrophic event that takes them offline or that uh, they can't operate there. This room is set up <clears throat> as their kind of backup communications area. We have what 50 911 lines, 100 phone lines, and some uh, fiber optic cable uh, plugged into the building. This is all computer panel flooring. So if we had to transplant them, we could transplant them here and plug and play them and run the cables through the floor up through these areas. In lieu of that, we're using this as our training room for all our uh, defensive tactics, the baton training, the, uh, we call them the red, red gun training, the dummies and physical wrestling and power uh, pain, uh, pressure point techniques. So 
but gives us that opportunity as well because <clears throat> for that we used to have to find space at the schools or beg borrow and steal other people's area now we can do all the training in our own building mm -hmm. and likewise this room is set up if we have a major task force that needs to assemble again we can put the task force in here plug and play them set them up with terminals have the internet connection uh, screens and the whiteboard all ready to go so and this uh harkens back to when we had the, the arson fires that mm -hmm. you had to assemble a task force and you actually had to move off site to have the space to be able to right we had seven teams of three people uh, a, a state investigator my investigator and a crime scene technician and they're working multiple crime scenes and they had a place to assemble we had no place to do that so we took over an old part of the state hospital that wasn't secure had no computer phone access uh, comp shouldn't say a complicated investigation, but it did. It was very difficult for us to work through that. Now, if an event like that ever happens, or even smaller events, we can just set people up in there and plug and play, and they're right next to the detective bureau, which is the reason this room is here. Yeah, yeah. So now you mentioned the detective bureau. The detective bureau used to share three offices for all nine people. It was just really uh, difficult, closed-in areas. Um, the detective sergeant now has her own office. In here, uh, where she used to have to share an office with two other detectives and all our IT forensic equipment. This is Detective McMahon. Detective uh, Sergeant Ann McMahon. Mm -hmm. So again, a nice space that they can work in. Detective Lieutenant Watson, similar as an office. Recorded. We have two interviewers ups upstairs, two interview rooms downstairs. The detectives can bring people in, witnesses, suspects, to interview them, flip the switch, get it audio and video recorded. Um, same thing downstairs, patrol has one for their use, and then we have one in the lockup area for interviewing a uh, arrestee. Uh, in our old station, we had one room, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it was smaller than this, and it doubled as a property and evidence locker area. So when you have uh, multiple people that are witness to an incident, and you need to keep bringing them in, now you can do four at a time instead of line them up and do them one at a time. And if you've got a suspect that needs to be interviewed, downstairs you got the witness or victim up here they don't ever cross paths that was a problem with the old building so the control rooms they can monitor and record all the uh, uh, audio and video interviews so so gone are the days when there was one-way glass that people would be yeah. watching interviews there now yeah. everything's on video everything's and, and video. recorded yeah, so And then the forensics IT office. This is where all the video recovery, audio recovery. Uh, you just, you name it, we can do it. Uh, we got a grant several years ago for $50,000 piece of technology that we were able to help other departments and some federal agencies off uh, sometimes come up here and ask for assistance. We can pull video off of any format, any recorder, any whatnot. And this is where also we do the internet uh, crimes against children, uh, the online stalking, bullying if it happens locally, child pornography, uh, that's what these folks special The design we did was just to have a nice, uh, pretty, attractive uh, bathroom, not just block walls, but tiles. It wasn't an extra expense really when it came down to it. So all our bathrooms were designed uh, in this manner and it was it's just beautiful and a morale builder and it makes the place look nice. It doesn't have an institutional look. No, 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 no. Yeah. Go to the, so, every one mm -hmm. of the back. Accreditation and training, Sergeant. Hmm. Again, we are very proud of our fourth uh, renewal for accreditation and I've been strongly committed to training, training at all levels, specialized training, basic training, uh, renewable training, in-service training, and we have a very young department, so uh, we're constantly in trying to increase pe people's skills and abilities, so, you know, we've dedicated an office in one street sergeant's position. He has duties on the street, but he is the accreditation and uh, training sergeant, and then there's a training lieutenant as well that oversees that part of it. In Northampton's among a small group of departments that is accredited. Correct. So not very many have uh, attained. I think that there's now up to, I think, 26 statewide that are accredited. Um, 
out of 351. We were one of the first six uh, back in the late 1900s. No, 1990s. <laughs> Wasn't that long ago. Before the turn of the century. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Just come full circle to the second floor. We're back outside the administrative area, and um, you know, I just like to thank the, for the opportunity to uh, have MCTV uh, put this production together. I hope the people that view it uh, enjoy it, and I hope they understand that uh, I and all my people are extremely thankful for all the support we've had and the fact that uh, the Northampton voters uh, voted the debt exclusion override to uh, to build this beautiful building. So. Um, just ecstatic with it and I thank you and I want to thank you chief for giving us this tour today and I want to thank you for your leadership of the department and your leadership on this project and your determination over all these years I know you've made this your top priority since you've become chief and and it's taken a while with some fits and starts but uh, it's a really beautiful building and it's a tribute to your leadership and again uh, I want to thank the men and women of the department who serve our community every day I will pass that on great thank you mayor Okay, we're back in my office at City Hall, and again, I want to thank Chief Sinkowitz for giving us that tour of the new police station. What an amazing facility. I also, of course, want to thank the voters of Northampton, the citizens of Northampton, who've supported the men and women of our police department and given them this wonderful new facility that they can work out of. I know it's going to be an outstanding facility, not only now, but for years to come. And I want to thank you for tuning in to this first episode of the Mayor's Report. And I want your feedback. I want to hear from the people about what things they'd like to see on this program. We've set up an email address, mayorsreport at comcast.net. Send me your questions. Send me your suggestions so that we can improve this program and make it as useful for you as possible. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz. This has been the Mayor's Report. And I look forward to seeing you next time.